Hello, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. In this episode, I'll talk to the literary scholar Stephen Greenblatt. I first read his book, The Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve, and found it compelling reading about that myth and its development throughout history with its ultimate adoption by Judeo-Christian theology and its subsequent demise, at least among rational individuals. He won the Pulitzer Prize for his seminal work, The Swerve, which also won the National Book Award. It starts out as a riveting detective story of the 14th century discovery of Lucretius's poem on the nature of things, and then turns into a brilliant discussion of the significance of the dissemination of this work for helping spur the Renaissance interest in science and nature, and helping remove God from getting in the way of our understanding of the universe. I found his recent book, Tyranny, fascinating. That book returns him to one of the areas of his great distinction as one of the world's leading Shakespearean scholars, as well as being a literary historian. It was written after the election of Donald Trump, and it uses Shakespeare to describe how a population can allow a tyrant who lies to gain power. For me, Stephen's great skill, besides his native eloquence, is to describe how literature relates to reality. And that provides us additional insights we can all use. Patreon subscribers can find the full video of all of our programs as soon as they're released at patreon.com slash origins podcast. It was a pleasure to spend time with this brilliant mind and scholar. I hope you enjoy the show. Well, Stephen, it is so great to be here with you. Uh, it, I, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. And, um, it's, for me, it's, it's every time I open a book by you, it's like, it's like a feast. And so, um, I'm sure it will, it, being able to talk to you about it will be equally exciting. So thank you. We'll see. <laughs> Let's, you know, uh, the, before we get to the, uh, some of the ideas and, 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 and I want to learn about what sort of your take on why, why you wrote some of these books, uh, in particular that you've written, but, um, I want to, since it's an origins related thing, I wanted to talk about your origins, which I th- I was learning about and have, have been quite interesting. I think uh, I, I, I don't think so. Yeah, well, but, but you know, uh, you, you have a, sort of a, had a, a had kind of a musical background. I, I, at some point, Art Garfunkel. So. No, not really. <laughs> I mean, I, I was in the summer camp for yeah. overprivileged children one summer with <laughs> with Art Garfunkel, who was a uh, very nice fellow, played the guitar mm-hmm. um, and sang in a sweet voice and and I uh, like to sing as well I uh, uh, he introduced me to a friend of his uh, at that time I didn't realize his friend was a genius I mean <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, there was a pleasant time uh, together but he's gone on to well you know, a far and, more and, glorious uh, career than well me. you know well I don't know about that and then you but you then you had another interaction with it and then at Cambridge you were you you were you performed with some interesting people as well. I did. I, I Cambridge again in the the most uh, half-assed and modest way. I was a member of something called the Footlights, which was a comedy routine place. Mm-hmm. We, we used to wear the head smokers. They called them. We uh-huh. would, would would go uh, dress up in the in your black tie and do kind of yeah. comedy. And it turned out that the again it was largely because a person lived down the hall from me in, uh, in my uh, college, Cambridge College, was Eric Idle, who was with his pals, the, pe- uh, the person who founded Monty Python's Flying Circus. It's, it's great. And who actually sings, I think it's his song, a song um, he's crucified at the end yes. of Life of Brian, and, yeah. and uh, sings song. Always Look on the Bright, bright side, side of Life. Yes. Yeah, he always... That's, <laughs> that's, his, that, then now, that's one of his claims to fame, he <laughs> yeah. wrote, wrote that song. Yeah, Eric is a friend. In fact, Eric will... will, will, will uh, become to a podcast. Ah, too. really? Good. But, but, I, uh, I've kept up with him. I mean, and he just wrote his autobiography. Autobiography. You know, that's absolutely. very charming. And and uh, we've, we've met and talked about science uh, as well as other things. And yeah. uh, He's great. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, well, it was great because it it reflected on life. And I think that's what I want to want to talk about with you, with your, with your uh, things. So, by the way, as an aside, and I, we may, did you, also another friend of mine who was part of that is Trevor Nunn. Did you know Trevor Nunn? No, of course I know who he is. I mean, very well, but that's interesting. There's your friend. I just taught, um, among other things, um, Merchant of Venice. Yeah. And I used his, I think, sensational 
uh, uh, tape video of that production with Henry yeah. Goodman. That one of the best productions of Richard Metz was I've seen ten thousand times that I've ever seen. Well, uh, yeah, Trevor's Trevor's uh, fa- also fascinating. Actually, he 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 attends um, he attend, attended some of my physics classes when I taught in London. His, really, his, yeah, oh, his son is his son is interested in science. And oh, yeah. Your your son is sort of interested in science as well, right? He's interested in science. I mean, he's also a classicist. Yeah. Uh, oh. He's a seventeen. It's my youngest son, a seventeen year old. It's it's he is is interested in science, but maybe relevant to a conversation that we're having yeah. is that he has those. Uh, has a, has had a powerful version of what I think many of us, most of us as human beings have at some point of you can, it comes on you when you look up at the night sky yeah. or when you, when you, when someone that you know dies. I yeah. mean, and so, and you think, what is this all about? Yeah. Uh, what does it mean? And he has, he's, this year he's a senior in high school. He's been uh, grappling in a, in a way that I find powerful and poignant uh, with with questions questions I can't answer, you might yeah. be a little closer to answer. Yeah. Uh, and cl- such as, what is the relationship between time and space? Well, yeah. d- damned <laughs> if I know. I mean, but I but did. I get that they're important questions. <laughs> well, they are important questions, but the questions are important, and it's great that he's asking them. It's it's it because it's the questions that I have of, often say in teaching and learning. That I mean, that, that's what it's all about, and and education should. Develop questions and t- and and parents like you and teachers should be when they say I don't know let's maybe you can we can figure this out together or maybe no one knows or maybe let's talk about it and yeah uh, no I had the equivalent of you know ask your mother which is to say <laughs> I, I get started by giving him a copy of Stephen Hawking's uh, Hawking's <laughs> book and then I called my friend Peter Gallison yeah. and I said do you, you, you mind talking to my <laughs> kid and so forth what's interesting I think genuinely interesting again for our purposes is that their questions, for some people at least, and f- for him, uh, their questions not simply of a kind of neutral, random curiosity. They're questions that have a kind of, of existential power, including um, anxiety sure. or angst about uh, what, what is this? And I th- it, the reason that that's important is that lots of the things that you think about and study, lots of the lives that you're the, uh, your own life and other lives are, are, are driven not simply by random uh, um, a, a passing question, but but something passionate, obsessional, uh, full of full of uh, sound and fury, and yeah. that it also leads to things like religion. Uh, well, you know it, that was a great way of almost segueing to the fact that that we maybe that's why I'm so attracted by part, but not just your scholarship, but to the ideas because. Uh, the connection between science and culture is intimate and should be intimate. But in our society, uh, you know, ever since the two cultures has been, has been often, some people think there's some separation between the two. And, and what, what I find in your, in your writing that I want to explore is, is the notion that literature is this yearning to understand reality in one way or another. And, and I, if I were trying to think about the, the ways I would classify the, 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 the the book series I know the best, uh, Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve, The Swerve, Tyrant. It's in some ways, how, what, what, not just what we can learn about the human condition, but what we can learn about life, if, and you forgive me, life, the universe, and everything from the way people think about it in terms of passion, anxiety, uh, love, sex, and everything else. And, 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 uh, and I'm drawn, I, I see a connection, and maybe I'm inventing one between some of the books that I want to go into, but I want to... I want to just go back for one second to, so, okay, you had, you know, these interesting, fun experiences with, with the different groups. And I was going to say, if, you know, if you could become Monty Python, you'd be famous, but you're pretty famous. So it's okay. Um, but what, what initiated your love of literature? Where did that come from? I mean, there are probably, if I actually am answering this question truthfully, going back as far as I can, um, I, first of all, there's a sort of family history, but not all that, like all of these things, not all that interesting in family mm-hmm. history, but it doesn't mean it's not deep yeah, sure. in one's life. I, I mean, that is to say, my father was a grand uh, storyteller, sort of performer of stories, joke teller. I can't tell a joke to save my life, but <laughs> I grew up in Boston. My father knew everyone, and when he was a lawyer and we walked up and down State Street in Boston, he would stop people and tell elaborate stories, the punchlines of which were usually in Yiddish. I didn't understand what oh, usually what was oh. being said, but but the stories were... 
were uh, extravagant. And he was he was wonderful at it. He, when he was old, he would tell the same stories over and over again in the way one does, but yeah. uh, he was good at it. And my mother was a different kind of storyteller. So she was uh, an intimate storyteller with stories about just about me uh, or about some um, person like me. So that was also important um, and, and, and had a kind of impact. I say that be- only because, of course, the more approximate answer is that I went to school. I loved to read. Mm-hmm. Uh, I we had we had very few books in our house, but one of the books that we had was a golden book copy of the Arabian Nights, and I remember reading over and over again yeah. this uh, these stories, especially about Sinbad the Sailor mm-hmm. and the Rock, and so forth and so on. And the and why did they reach me so powerfully? Well, I mean, maybe as I say, because I had already been primed for it by uh, my parents and or maybe just other things a desire to escape from from uh, suburban newton massachusetts into yeah. some uh, fantasy world of the arabian nights now if you're well it, it, so if you if you come from that background uh, your your father was a lawyer yes so, so okay so so he was educated in that sense and had gone to college i was wondering where did your parents hope for Something other than literature as your future—a doctor, or a lawyer—they would have been happy. But but uh, I think if I had become a lawyer, my older brother's a lawyer, so he, mm. in some sense, he took the yeah, the necessary to move. <laughs> uh, my father, my, my mother didn't go to college. My my father, as the girl, she wasn't it wasn't yeah. part of the family plan. Yeah, Her brother yeah. went to college, but she didn't. They mm. were people of very modest means. My father was of extremely modest means. His father was a rag picker. Uh, in Boston. My father was born in 1897, so we're talking a long time yeah, ago. Sure. And in those days, you didn't have to go to college to become a lawyer. Uh, he, you, he went my, to a, you went directly to law school. Yeah, he, yeah. He, went, he, gra- he went, he was briefly in the army in World War I and then mm. went to directly to law school. So uh, it, it, it wasn't a life in which he had, uh, I grew up uh, in a, uh, a academic family household. saturated yeah. with, with academic ambitions. Yeah. So, but of course we had we had the ambitions that um, especially uh, Jews of that generation yeah. had, yeah. that their children would do something with their lives. Yeah, um, be educated in some ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then do something. But yeah. when I said that I was going to, I went back and forth in an extremely tedious way between whether I should go to law school or go to uh, graduate school oh, mm-hmm. in, in English. Uh, uh, and I bored myself and everyone to, to death with this question. Uh, and then... Uh, when I actually had a Fulbright to Cambridge, uh, which is why I know Eric Idle. And then I had applied when I was a senior in college to, to law school. I'd get in to just a Yale Law School and I'd get mm-hmm. in. <clears throat> but I deferred it. Mm-hmm. And then at, in the middle of my first year in Cambridge, I was in Istanbul on a vacation. They have mm-hmm. Cambridge has these crazy long vacations, mm-hmm. uh, six weeks long. Yeah. So I went to Istanbul, uh, uh, to Istanbul and I someone forwarded me. In those days, you got these letters forwarded to Amex, uh, mm-hmm. to the American Express oh, office. Yeah. Someone yeah. forwarded to me a renewal of my Fulbright and a renewal of the of the Yale deferment. Thing, deferment and I, the law school, and I went out onto the bridge over the Galata <laughs> and I held both letters very with much as, of a sense of myself as <laughs> at a turning point in my life. And I tore up the Yale law school letter. I throw, threw oh, it in the water. I wrote to my parents and said I was going to stay uh, and then go to graduate school. And they didn't oh, make a fuss. That was quite a dramatic way of doing it. That's yeah. really, uh, that's fascinating. It's self-theatricalizing. Well, it's, it, I for, yeah, you and you went to Yale as an undergraduate, right? And it's, it's I interesting. Did. And so the, you're, you're this being torn between the world mm. of literature and, and law. You know, it's interesting because I, I taught a course at Yale when I, when I was a professor there and, um, it's a standard physics course called Physics for Poets, you know, or uh, at least that's what it's often I, called. I'm sure I took it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, but on the other hand, the interesting thing was I, I at one point wanted to change it to Physics for Lawyers because in all the time I taught at Yale, I met a lot of lawyers to be, but no poets to be. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, but the poetry of your writing, I mean, as I say, I just find the topics that you cover in a, in a context of literature fascinating and and. Um, obviously, the swerve has had a profound impact. It's won National Book Award, Pulitzer Prize, and it's uh, it it is a, about a a little bit of serendipity. I mean, the fa- the fascinating aspect that the 
that still almost terrifies me to think how close in many ways, and, and also bittersweet, how many amazing bits of knowledge and literature were lost. Yes. Uh, but the fact that certain key things were, were, dis, were survived a very improbable history to make it to, to the modern world, and, and in, as you would argue in the case of Lucretius, to help create the modern world. I, I actually, this is probably not the occasion to do this, but I, I, I would love to ask you a question. Sure. Which is a question that has haunted, haunted me in writing this book and continues to haunt me. What if it had been lost? Wouldn't it have unfolded in, you know, different but ultimately <laughs> the same way and maybe even in the same time scale? Well, you know, it's, of course, what have could have and should have. It's a fascinating question, what would have happened? I, I, and because I've thought about that, what if Einstein hadn't, you know, what if his parents had been killed or what? But uh, you're right. I think that, I think that, I do think that all of us feel like we have produced, you know, if we've tried to produce something that somehow is a reflection of us, but I think it's more a reflection of the time that these ideas are often bubbling up. And in science, at least, if someone, if, if, you know, if, if Einstein hadn't been around and Einstein, you know, was amazing and did amazing things, the things he developed would have been discovered because the, the, because the process of science guarantees that. And I suspect creative minds who were yearning to move beyond, at least as far as I can see, the, 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 the imprisonment of mind of the of the, that ultimately led to blossoming of the Renaissance and Enlightenment, that 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 would have happened. The well, the question I suppose, I mean, the question mm -hmm. of someone outside your world wants to ask is, what do you mean the process of science would have guaranteed that? Well, what yeah, guarantees well, are okay, there? Well, the guarantee. Well, okay, this is good because we'll come back. Maybe those guarantees are or aren't there in literature, but science overcomes the process of science overcomes scientists. Science, the process of science, because scientists have biases and beliefs, and and I mean, scientists are human. It's a little known fact, <laughs> and and uh, and 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 therefore they want to believe things that make them feel good. We all do, and um, but the process of skeptical inquiry of of testing your ideas of experiment, a retesting, as as Feynman used to say, trying to prove yourself wrong as much as prove yourself right, mm -hmm. ultimately sift out those those those, those uh, human biases and uh, you know I've written about that it's 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 fascinating to see how pe how scientists have been caught on in 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 fads and fallacies yes uh, but but because ultimately the arbiter of truth is nature and that's probably the most important thing it's not beauty it's not elegance it's not revelation all of those things in fact are are it, it, one could say, as one could be suspicious of. I'm certainly, I, I would argue, and maybe we could have a debate about this, that nothing has ever come from revelation, nothing significant in terms of knowledge, but that 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 nature ultimately determines whether, you, no matter how beautiful your ideas are, that if they don't agree with nature, they just get tossed out like yesterday's newspaper. But here's uh, the situation in the case of Lucretius's poem, De Rerum Natura. There had been uh, a long process of, thinking, mm -hmm. starting in, in Greece and the, on the island of Abdera, where yeah. I've never been, but yeah. I mean, where where Democritus and Lucius yeah. came from, yeah. uh, of thinking about what the world is made of and a set of non-experimental hypotheticals that, that actually moved in a in an unexpected and interesting direction toward the idea that, that they must this is not the interesting part, that they must be smaller and smaller things that yeah. they're made of. That's a natural thing to think. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, but they began to think hard about what it means, the smaller and smaller things. How small could they be? What what Could they get smaller than dust motes? Or the the tiniest things you could see if you're very nearsighted on, a, on an insect? Uh, and... Uh, and in that case, would they be small Lawrence Krauses or they, <laughs> a little tiny Stephen Greenblatt, or would they be something else, and so forth? And they developed over a long period of time, um, when in a set of astonishing uh, experimental, non non experimental thinking experiments, not not yeah, experiments which was a, with the world, which was key uh, different between the classical world and yeah, the modern one. But. They developed a set of ideas that get expressed in the uh, in the remarkable poem that I write my book about. But here's, to go back to our, the question we started with, here's what happens um, for various reasons having to do, but principally having to do with with trouble in the Roman Empire and, yeah. and with the rise of, of Christianity. Uh, a 
uh, ethical monotheism, uh, single uh, notion of a single God triumphs. Mm -hmm. They basically, the, the drive, including the intellectual drive behind this theory, but also lots of other institutional mm -hmm. considerations, basically forces this alternative notion of a world made of matter and yeah. emptiness and nothing else underground yeah. for 1,500 years. It's amazingly effective. I mean, that, so that's, I mean, we could say that the process of science guarantees something. It doesn't guarantee the pace uh, yeah. that it's going to happen and, or when and, it's going to happen. And 1,500 years is a long time because were. it's not as if there weren't intelligent people during those 1,500 years. And plenty of people who must have thought, it can't be this notion of a kind of divine father who's made all this stuff yeah. can't be the only account. It doesn't explain why my child has died. Yeah. I don't feel my child did anything and so forth. The 10,000 things that sentient human beings feel is probably wrong with the uh, ethical, su supposedly ethical monotheistic yeah. account yeah. of and the universe. And there is this alternative idea, but it's way underground at this point. And it's remarkable that it, well, I, I think it's, it's remarkable that it was so effectively pushed pushed underground. I mean, we, we were talking the other day about this about a book of, um, by I guess Catherine Nixie Nixon mm -hmm. Nixie. Nixie Nixie yeah about it, it was it's amazing to me uh, to have read that uh, about how effective the early Christians were at they couldn't have uh, you know uh, almost unless if there'd been a master plan if there'd been the final solution at that time they couldn't have as effectively. Uh, basically rid the world of the, not just the polytheism of of Greeks and Romans but the but the love of philosophy the love of of questioning yes. um, and they and it and it it makes Isis look tame well you look uh the word heresy yeah. comes from hieresis mm -hmm. which means choice they didn't want Choice. Yeah. And, I mean, and choice so, was you you walked in an ancient Athens you walked and you could decide you were going to uh Go if you were a thoughtful person. Mm. You, you, there were a number of philosophical schools that yeah. had their locations yeah. up uh, yeah. uh, uh, on the hill. You could go to uh, think about being a Platonist or an Aristotelian. You could be a skeptic, or you could be an Epicurean, and mm -hmm. think about these things. You made a choice, yeah. and that was exactly the situation of intellectual f free choice that seemed intolerable. Intolerable because not because they were. I mean, Catherine Nixie has. And there were plenty of wicked people, yeah, but yeah. it's not wickedness yeah. it, uh, dominant. It's a sense that you shouldn't allow people to do that because it's bad for them. It's bad for them that somehow, right. when once you know the absolute truth, you can yeah. tell other people exactly it's, what to do. Thomas More said, and More was a very thoughtful and in, in certain aspects of his life, decent person in the early 16th yeah. century. But he said, you can't allow heresies to circulate because it's allow it's allowing the sale of poison bread. Yeah, we can't allow the sale of poison bread. Yeah, uh, well, so it, you take you start down that path, then you start burning people to death. Yeah, or, exactly. Or it's amazing books. how I mean the intent. It, very few people, I think, intend to do bad. I think they think that what they're doing is generally they think that what they're doing is for a higher purpose. Well, you know, other than psychotic people, perhaps, but even those people, perhaps. And it, it's interesting. We'll come back to modern times. We'll come back to tyrant because I think we see some of that in the in in the current times. The the this this effort to squash certain things, uh, 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 including including to some extent free speech, figuring that it's bad for people. It's not that it's not that we're trying to people are trying to constrain others. They somehow think that the free speech harms, and um, and the notion I think that this dog what effectively suppressed the kind of open minded questioning of Lucretius, uh, this dogma, this religious dogma. Um, it's hard to know how. It, it certainly is very easy and overpowering, but I don't know how sustainable it is. Because ultimately, the point about science, the reason science uh, ultimately triumphs, if you want to put it that way, is that it works. It's not. I, I don't think that it's that it's profound. It's just that science works. It leads. It allows you to explain the world better. Allows you to make predictions, and allows you to to ultimately, therefore, have more power over your surroundings and potentially others. And I think, ultimately, when it's amazing, and I think it, it, it ties into the rise and fall of Adam and Eve, there, there's a wonderful story of a rise of something, as I think you put it, that begins as a sort of a, an illusion 
becomes dogma, becomes truth, uh, then becomes reality, and then becomes uh, 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 laughable. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, I I can't quote you exactly, but it was but that I remember reading that trajectory as you describe that, and and so that in some in some sense it's kind of interesting those two discussions are the two books I view as inversions of one another. Ah, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. They are, they are inversions of one another. The one is the uh, one book is about what undid the other. <laughs> yeah, books. it's kind of I found that that uh, amazing. I don't. Did you? Was that conscious in your mind? Yes, very conscious. Yeah, it's really it's uh, really fascinating. Uh, but look, to go back to something you just said. Yes, it's. Uh, I wouldn't question what you've said about the way in which science enables you to make certain predictions, to do mm-hmm. certain things. The trick about this is that uh, the the alternative uh, alternative religious ideas. The, um, the polytheist ideas against which Luc- Lucretius was also arguing. Yeah. I mean, he's writing 50, 50 BCE before Christianity. Mm-hmm. Uh, he might have vaguely known something about what the Jews had in mind, yeah. but, but th- that probably seemed to him completely absurd. I yeah. mean, uh, but, and then Christianity, Judaism, the, uh, they also allow you to make predictions to do things they may the predictions may not always work uh, but predictions don't always work so that if it turns out that that you uh, have said something is going to happen it doesn't happen then you come up with another theory as to why it didn't happen prophecies always work only when they're after after so in other words it it, at least in this period of particularly I, i i have about experimental science um, that you will know more than I, yeah. and I. But about that, this, that, that arose much later. I mean, yeah. the science the, of the Greek, Greeks and Romans it wasn't experimental. Yeah, and in this period, after all, when when a perfectly intelligent person Cicero, uh, who who's takes in what what's at stake in Epicureanism of thinking mm-hmm. that the world is. is has no plan, no mm-hmm. divine plan. That it doesn't require an intelligent design. That mm-hmm. it's it's uh, it, it result it it's the result of endless swerves and mutations. That and so forth and so on. All the rest of the account. When he weighs this, he he particularly weighs what uh, what the Epicureans said was the what was the real utility, a therapeutic utility of this, which is that you shouldn't be afraid of death. Uh, you shouldn't be afraid of death because you're not going to exist after you die. There's nothing that you're going to, you're not going to miss anything mm. uh, because you won't, you won't exist I yeah. mean, and so forth. Cicero says, that's the good news. This is terrible. <laughs> uh, and and you see, I mean, in other words, it it's not always the case that these, it, I do think that this account of the world anticipates in interesting ways mm-hmm. what I think rationally we now since the late 70th yeah. century have be- come to believe is the case but the idea that it's consoling is not clear uh, i don't ever try never to use the word believe is the case what what appears to be the case yes, say, from, right. as a scientist i think uh, i find myself using that word but but believe is no is not relevant it's sort of be, because you know the, because the big bang happened whether you believe in it or not and the sun's going to shine today what that's true it? and yeah. so the, my believe is not a gesture toward doubt yeah, yeah. so much as a gesture toward the notion but you probably deal with it in different ways. You, We know that in 500 years, our account of the Big Bang and the rest of it won't be their account of the Big Bang. Well, it'll be subsumed. But again, once it, okay, well, we can, I want to focus in, but I'll, I'll just, I'll just give you one of my views here. But, I, I'm, but, inter- yeah, I'm genuinely be, interested. Because, I know I'm, I'm not interviewing yeah, you, but I no, am it's genuinely a, interested. It's a, no, it's, it's a dialogue. So, and, 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 uh, and, and it's fascinating for me to have these discussions and, and learn and, and give and take. But uh, the the what what people don't understand about scientific revolutions, perhaps the biggest misconception about scientific revolutions, is that they do away with everything that went before them. They're not like that. I, in fact, real revolutions never do either. Although people attempt to, I think we can learn from from history. And and I think Mark Twain said that, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes a lot. But uh, that that scientific revolutions, in particular, I will t- no matter what we learn about quantum gravity five hundred years from now. When I take a ball here on the surface of the earth and let go, it's going to fall. And it's going to fall as it was described by Newton and Galileo before him. Nothing we learn about the forefront of science can undo that which properly explains the, the phenomena we see. 
We're not going to suddenly say the ball is going to fall up. Now, we subsume that, and the underlying picture can be quite different. So our underlying picture of the fundamental structure of the world could be quite different. But ultimately, 500 years from now, people who are, if there are people designing rocket ships and cannonballs, Newton's laws will work just as well then as they do now. Uh, and I think, uh, granted, but wouldn't you, I mean, as they say, this is, uh, wouldn't you say, and this is a defense of my belief, that um, the people who thought that Newton's account uh, was the way things are in the natural uh, world, really the way things are, they account yeah. for, that that turned out to, to be untrue. That And that notion, you're absolutely right. And and I think what we realize is that, mm. in fact, one of the great triumphs of science, I've written about it, but it's probably one of the least well understood triumphs of science, is there is no such thing as scientific truth. We've learned that all of our theories have a domain of applicability. And there is no, there's no one theory that that we know of, at least at this point, or some string theorists may have hopes and dreams, but but there's no theory that describes the universe on all scales. The best theory we have of nature, something called quantum electronics, uh, which agrees with experiment to 14 decimal places, you know, there's nowhere else in the world where from fundamental theory you can make a prediction that agrees with nature to 14 decimal places. Even that theory we know breaks down at some scale. So so the notion that the way things, in fact, Lucretia's notion or, or, or Newton's, that that's the way things are, we now understand no one can say that. That's the way things are on a certain scale and in a certain time and space and time. And, and on a grander scale, uh, what what is interesting and so far has been true in science is that when we go to more and more fundamental scales, we find that these these diverse and, and distinct phenomena are understood in terms of a simpler whole. That's been very satisfying. And the underlying picture looks quite different. The yeah. underlying structure of nature looks completely different than, than what we see in this room. This is an illusion. Um, but there's but the physics that describes it goes on with in this room works darn well and it's a pretty good way of understanding what happens but no one thinks it's it's ultimate truth you know in fact there was one line I remember one of the reasons I was I first thought boy I want to talk to Stephen about this was I think I think it was in the early on in the swerve uh, that there's the notion you know, you point out the notion of atoms, which of course pr- wasn't unique to him as Democritus and, and others, but but the notion not just that there was some fundamental object from which all other things could be made, but it was eternal. Yes. And that's and and th- that struck me because, uh, you know, I just gave you my book, Adam, but the interesting thing is that atoms aren't eternal. And I wonder how Lucretius would have felt. As far as we know, there's not only no, no ultimate reality per se it's it's different understandings of reality that we can explore uh, uh n- but but there's nothing that's eternal even atoms atoms come as close uh, as we as, as anything to eternal but uh, the, the the thing that motivated me to think about this and it was was actually going to the to going to the um rodin museum and seeing the kiss that famous yes that's and, and i looked at it and i thought wow there's an there's an instant captured for eternity but it's not eternal the, the atoms and the marble the marble's only getting around for 10 or 100 million years what about and then the atoms it turns out weren't even around in the early history of the universe and and the as we as our current picture of physics suggests the atoms won't be around in the in the far far future they'll they're the only parts of us that have a, a potential grasp on eternity but even they will be gone in the far future but and so i, mean, I wonder I think, how lucretius you know, would have thought of that i think actually of course, we don't know, but yeah. I think that that wouldn't have disturbed him uh, in a way that thinking that the atoms were not what he uh, what he thought that they were, semina rerum, he calls mm-hmm. them in Latin, the seeds of things. And he thought that they, he took on the Greek notion as built into the word atom, that they mm-hmm. were uh, unbreakable, the fineless, yeah, yeah. Un- which they're also not. Which are also not, uh, absolutely. So I think he would have found the unbreakable part a little unnerving. I think the eternal thing, the, what he didn't want, the reason he, I think, the reason he insisted that they were eternal was that he didn't want the notion of creation. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the notion of creation seemed to him to get into the full, uh, full-fledged <laughs> account in which there would be a god. Yeah, well, he's not there. I mean, that's probably, you hit the two things, probably creation and death, that are probably the two logical issues that 
that that have driven people for millennia and probably will continue to drive people to to God or religion. How can how can you have a world? How can you have something from nothing? As, and which which is a sub subject of another of my books. But but and 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 isn't and how can we start? Can we ever conquer death? And is death the end and the ultimate fear? Yeah, I and, think you see the eternal. He wasn't interested in eternal life in mm-hmm. the way that the most religious traditions are. Mm-hmm. He didn't think that he was going to come back. Mm-hmm. He thought if all the atoms that made him up were reconstituted and he walked around again, it wouldn't be him anyway. I mean, Which, that, uh, absolutely he, he, very uh, prescient because it's true. Uh, <laughs> he, 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 he Montaigne, who was in the uh, 16th century, the, maybe the person who took in most completely what was at stake in the recovery of Lucretius' De Remnator, he thought he and his sort of sublime egotism thought yeah. that, yes, maybe all the atoms could come back and they there could be another Montaigne. And he did think it might be he. Uh-huh. But uh, I think Lucretius thought that there was a, uh, you know, was a hopeless idea. Not that it couldn't happen mm-hmm. in the infinite amount of time, but that it wouldn't be you. Well, you know, it, it, it's fascinating. Um, the, how, again, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Because one of the, just out, out of it, interest for you, perhaps one of the debates in science right now is, could the, is our universe unique? I don't know if Lucretius ever even thought of that because it means, def, it means semantically redefining what you mean by universe. And universe used to mean when you and I were both growing up, everything, at least that's what I remember it being. And, but now we have a very specific definition of universe, which is all the, the region and space and time that I could have won, or I, but in a generic sense, I could have once contacted or one day contact. So the the region of space in which things can affect other things, either now or in the infinite future. And if there's other regions where you could never have an impact, we tend to call those other universes and maybe the laws of physics are different in them. But the interesting question that's risen is, in a universe that say, and our universe looks like it's expanding forever, a universe that's infinite in time, could it be that, uh, you know, in as Woody Allen said, infinity is a long time, especially near the end. And and uh, in, if it's infinite, then can the same things happen over and over again? It's because di- infinity is different than very something very long. Could if it's infinite, there's a non-zero probability that a, that a planet could form, and that you know that that everything that we see could be the same, except maybe y- you were doing y- you were doing science and I was doing literature. But then there's an, an, an equally infinite number of worlds in which in which uh, you're doing almost exactly the same thing or exactly the same. It's an interesting question. And I have to say that there's a lot of sense and a lot of nonsense being written now in science about that particular subject. And it's fascinating to see that, that, that Lucretius at least addressed that notion, that the same notion of, of whether, whether you could have a copy of a person either at a different time or a different space. I think he thought that the whole... Uh as I say, he's writing largely, uh, he's writing not so much as a scientist, but as a therapist. Yeah. Uh, and as a therapist, I think he thought that the, that the f- encouraging people to think that it's going to keep going on or that yeah. it'll come back is actually a very bad thing. It leads to a lot of un- nasty things in the world. And, uh, and, and it's better to think, uh, to, to, uh, to be persuaded that it really does come to an end, and that uh, that's okay. Yeah, that's what. Well, you know, is he well, he was being a. I mean, one certainly gets a sense that he had a scientific sensibility. I mean, not in the modern sense. You you made a point that I think is really important to point out that at that time science didn't really involve it involved speculation, what we might call or thought, or what we call philosophy now, I guess. But but not experimental science, and that's the key difference. And you know, when I talk to my philosophy colleagues who who often. Um, you know, will tell me things I um, that I should know. And, um, you know, Aristotle has seemed to be loved by philosophers, and as a physicist, I, of course, Galileo made fun of him. But but more more directly, and I believe this is correct that he said that women have a different number of teeth than men. And I, when I, so whenever anyone talks about the wisdom of Aristotle, I say, well, he could have just opened someone's mouth. And, <laughs> and but that's the difference in yes. the in the. The modern worldview, but so so he, but he had the sensibility of a scientist that hey, it there's no not only is there no evidence that 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 there's anything else 
in other than what we see and 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 the world as it's made and it's and it's not d- created for us or will it be destroyed for us uh but that there is a danger in in ultimately letting we letting the fact that we all want to believe we all want to believe that somehow we're not going to end yes uh there's a danger in having that govern our existence and ultimately you know that's the danger of religion and 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 you talk in your book about whether i mean he probably was an atheist in that sense but he wasn't and and but but the notion of 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 the danger of religion actually to religion and tyranny are the things that seem to me to 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 connect the three books of yours that I that I that I focused on most tyranny the swerve and 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 the rise and fall of Adam and Eve the danger of inventing a world that doesn't really exist and the importance of literature and the enlightenment in exploring reality itself and being willing to accept reality for what it is i mean the only qualification i would put to what you uh, summarize is that inventing imaginary worlds is great i mean that that there's nothing i mean if, 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 nothing in uh lucretius or in uh to compare great things to small and me mm. that thinks mm. that this is a bad thing. It's just believing that it's true. Yeah, exactly. That's a disaster. Okay, that's been taken. Uh, and actually acting on that. Of course, we always want the universe to be good to us. Yeah. We want, I want to go to, to uh, my mailbox and open uh, the mail and be told that I've, you know, won the Irish sweepstakes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and I could even entertain the fantasy that, uh, if I walked around this table three times, it would make that more likely. But it's <laughs> yeah. actually thinking that it's true uh, that it, it leads you down very, very dangerous paths. It is exactly, but it's you know, th- and that's why I kind of so accepting religion as literature or literature as literature. I mean, creating creating uh, false worlds is is part of being human. And but I, I I think the point that 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 at least well I'd like to hear how I'm going to try and put words in your mouth that the value of it is not just that it's fun and it's part of being creative, but it helps illuminate and some one hopes it will help illuminate at some level some nature of the real world. Yes, it'll give additional insight. Well, two things to say: one is that that the, the way in which we there are very uh, there are multiple ways in which we try to apprehend the world. Uh, one is uh, through uh, whatever it is that you do, um, or that scientists do in a in a laboratory. I mean that that, but that's not your. You don't spend twenty four hours there anyway. I no. mean that uh, you might spend close to it some days, but yeah. not. Um, so that's one way we do it. But that's uh, very few people in our culture do this mm-hmm. professionally, and yeah. most of us do actually want to have some grasp on what the reality that we're experiencing is. And there are lots of ways of trying to uh, have such a grasp, but as for as far back almost as we can go to Gilgamesh yeah. uh, in uh, the Mesopotamian world or um, to, to Homer uh, in the Odyssey and the Iliad, we see that people have told stories, have represented mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Because representing, or to those cave paintings, representing the world, uh, humans have done this, actually, as far as we know, from the very earliest moments in which we yeah. became human, whatever yeah. we mean by that. We 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 have a mimetic impulse. Yeah. Uh, and we've developed this uh, mimetic impulse into astonishing things, into those... It, it, and it's not that they've been in a curve that makes them better and better. Mm-hmm. You look at those cave paintings in the Grotte de Chauvet, they're yeah. as good as anything yeah. gets in yeah. painting. Yeah, I mean, they're just astonishingly yeah. good. They're astonishingly uh, modern. And Homer, likewise, one of our yeah. earliest uh, poets, there's there's nothing better than the Iliad. It's not that, that King Lear is better mm-hmm. uh, or that, that Joyce is... Ulysses is better. They're wonderful. Those are, pe- people keep doing it. But it, it seems part of the human equipment uh, to be able to represent the world as a way of trying to grasp, to understand better than s- simply what happens when you walk around, uh, what it is that we are experiencing in the and, world. And, and this question of why, in some sense. And it's a are, kind of experimental space. Yeah. You can think of the Iliad as a kind of re- remarkable, absolutely brilliant experimental space to see what the nature of anger and 
power and violence uh, is in in that must have actually gone or been going on. We know was going on in uh, in the ordinary lives of Greeks of Homer's time. The artist yes. was just some person who was maybe by divine intervention had 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 developed the art, but they, were, they weren't special just because they were great actors. Yes. And, and that notion is so distinct from what we... Yes, it's true. It's, it's a little frustrating to, for, for literary critics like myself because Shakespeare is the perfect example. I mean, he's the greatest uh, writer for uh, in the last 2,000 years. No one bothered to interview him. No one bothered to, it, it, yeah, to because, have a conversation and record or, uh, what he said. It's, uh, it's such a different world, but at the no same, no one t- saved his papers. It's probably yeah. they were, were used to wrap fish. I mean, uh, that that's kind of maddening. Well, there's no doubt that people have a built-in desire to understand purpose and and to reflect. I mean, that, there's an evolution. There's a clear evolutionary reason for that, right? Um, I mean, I'm not the first one to point this out, the, but uh, by any means, but. Uh, we're here as, because of a lot of uh, successful ancestors, and and the ones who heard the rustling in the leaves and didn't and said, well, I want maybe I'm not going to worry about what that is." They didn't get to reproduce. Yes, and the ones who said, "Maybe it's a tiger, maybe it's a lion, maybe it's a," or uh, the ones who sat around the campfire and told a story and looked carefully at the faces of the people around them to see how they were reacting and were taking in certain things about their community. Those people probably did manage to reproduce or or at least there's a recent study of of hunter gatherers mm-hmm. in the philippines they did a very elaborate survey of them uh, and what they found was that the people routinely said that they'd much rather have in their group a good a really great storyteller than a great hunter or a great gatherer that's extremely odd and then it was borne out by the fact that their reproductive rates the reproductive rates of those identified as the best the storytellers story were higher I guess uh, one can that's understand that's that incredible they, well from a group perspective they 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 bring the group together right yeah. and i think the stories we well that's the purpose of religion it's not purpose but i mean the stories we tell in some sense tribal stories are what hold us together and religion is so is so ubiquitous i think because it it does such a good job of of creating in groups and out groups and us versus them and 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 creating a story creating a kind of a, a story that somehow binds people um in a way that that i think the the cosmos should but it's much harder it's it's you know it's it it is true that we are that every atom in our body comes from a star you know in different in different stars well, the, but that somehow seems less less immediate than saying we come from Adam and Eve. But it doesn't speak to our, or at least as directly to our fears and our desires. So it it binds us together. The cos- the vision of the cosmos bind- may bind us together. The the notion that we're made of the stuff that stars are made of uh, is a fantastic idea and might uh, link us. But does it, does it tell us uh, what, how to deal with what we're afraid of? Yeah, no. It, uh, it, well, we it, well, it doesn't, except maybe. And Lucretius, you know, it's interesting to me that you expressed what Lucretius said, because, again, it's an issue, it's uh, something I, uh, I always try and say in my in my dialogues, we should enjoy our brief moment of the sun. The fact that we'll disappear, for some, is tragic. But I think, I like to think for, from Lucretius, from my understanding, and most, and my understanding essentially completely comes from you, uh, that, that, we should enjoy our brief moment in the sun for a real reason that we that life is more precious because because it disappears that yes that, although that's actually a deep problem in lucretian philosophy why is life more precious why should you why is it better to live than not to live i think that is a a problem that's not easily answered in epicureanism in a way that it is easily answered in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, or whatever, there, there are a variety of, ex- where it's all part of a divine scheme, you're, you're, it's a way of serving God, and whatever the account would be. It's not clear in Lucretius why, why uh, essay is better than known essay. Mm-hmm. Uh, why, it, why, who, why does it matter? Uh, and is the, that a reason not to fear death, or is it? Or well, he thought that was a reason not to fear death. But there's another flip side of that, which is that, which is why then should you savor existence? Mm-hmm. Uh, not entirely clear. And the uh, his his way of dealing with that, but it isn't, as I say, philosophically 
I mean, there are people who are more expert than I am in, mm. in this, so they may have a different view. But it seemed to, seems to me that his way of dealing with that is to take a kind of swerve mm-hmm. uh, from that and say, it's the pursuit of pleasure. The reason that you you uh, save your existence is because we're, we're, we should pursue pleasure as our highest good. We don't pursue God as our highest good. Yeah. We don't uh, uh, pursue moral virtue as our highest okay. good. We pursue pleasure. And in that we share with all other sentient creatures. That's yeah. what an, a cow does. Yeah. That's what a cockroach yeah. does. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we, uh, that's what it is to be alive and to want to reproduce. Uh, and that's what, what he drew from that I mean, it's a complex, it actually, when you, it seems simultaneously simple, then when you push on it, it's rather complex. What sure. you drew from that was, a, was, first of all, it's not about you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not about you, Lawrence, yeah. Stephen, yeah. but it's not about you as a species. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you're not going to, you're not going to last forever, but also your species is not going to last forever. There, there's a constant set of mutations and adaptations to, to what's available in the universe, to how to, how to uh, eat and reproduce. And we do it well at the moment, apparently, but we're not going to do it forever. Something yeah. better will come along or the, the, our environment will change. What does that mean in terms of our long-term trajectory? But, and, and he recognized that. Totally recognized that. And it's, it, uh, what, you know, it's, uh, the, it's fun to have read your book side by side in preparation to talk to you again, because, because the fascinating thing is what, what you're leading to, of course, is, this, is, the, is the, impact in the more modern world that that darwin had on on our uh, on on our understand or at least confronted the, the religious worldview yes and 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 not and, an accident either for in terms of timing or maybe in terms darwin's uh grandfather rasmus darwin yeah uh you know was a passionate reader of lover of lucretius oh yeah wait oh uh, no I, I, absolutely i think that yeah exactly i mean the fact that darwin was darwin one can argue is not is, is understandable, but the the remarkable notion that that so if Lucretius was the, if the rediscovery of Lucretius was a harbinger or helped create the modern world, and and I think that, you know the one thing I didn't answer your other question about is I think the other thing that humans are built into is wanting to solve puzzles, which means asking questions, and what was amazing to me is not it's not amazing that that it, that that we recovered from the whatever you want to call the dark ages it's amazing that they survived for so long because there's this innate ultimately people had to recognize how ridiculous the dog some of the dogmas were just asking yourself the question including adam and eve i mean ultimately the the self-contradictory uh, uh, issues of good and evil of of taking people as you describe in adam and eve who were have no who are completely innocent and punishing them for something they have no idea is wrong uh uh, these questions must have been there, but there ultimately must have been an incredible fear. Well, there was an incredible fear of questioning because if you questioned, your life was in peril. But look, I I agree. And of course, you couldn't uh, stand up at a certain point and say, this you know, story is absurd uh, yeah. uh, as an origin story. There, yeah. there are, I'll, I'll tell you five other ones that are better yeah. and so forth and so on. So that's true. You would get in horrendous mm. trouble. You wouldn't. You you wouldn't uh, reproduce. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> survive. Yeah, yeah. That said, for me, and you may not agree with this, you probably don't agree with this, but I couldn't have written this. I couldn't have spent years thinking about the Adam and Eve story and writing this book on the rise and fall of the Adam and Eve story if I believed that it was contemptible and ridiculous. Oh, sure. Uh, I think that it is incredibly powerful, including the the things that are are to us the most... Uh, disturbing about the story, such as the fact that there's a, a prohibition not to eat of the tree of good and evil when it's only if you understood something about the difference between good and evil that you'd know how to observe a prohibition. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, yeah. But that's Kafka. Yeah. That's that's not absurdity. Well, it is absurdity, yeah. but in an existential sense yeah. that we're constantly confronted with situations like this. That's what it is to be, for one thing, it's what it is to, to be a child and mm-hmm. not understand... The, the, the nature of most of the rules uh, and yet have to be told that you have to obey them without horrendous yeah, consequences. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes actually there are horrendous consequences and so forth. In other words, the when I thought it was only 
ridiculous people. Mm -hmm. it, it, if I thought it was only ridiculous people who have a you know, want a theme park in which they ride dinosaurs yeah, in yeah, Kentucky, yeah, uh, I wouldn't have wanted to take this seriously. It's actually understanding that some of the most intelligent and thoughtful people for centuries and centuries uh, not only took this seriously, not because they were afraid, yeah. but because they thought there was something deep and important to learn from this, that that the that it is one of the great human fictions. Uh -huh. It's just a fiction. That's but the thing that's that the, you that's have the, to understand. It's a fiction. It's a, fi but, it's and, a work of literature, but a work of literature, it, a tiny one, but in its way as powerful as King Lear, as powerful uh, as... Uh, as anything that we, where we think, yes, so, the Mahabharata, this is a deep way of thinking about the world. So could we say, as a work of literature, it's remarkable and worthy of understanding. As a, as a work, of, as a bit of dogma, it's detestable? Totally de detestable. Of course. And, I mean, and destructive. Well, I, mean, it's, I knew the, I mean, you write, it's clear that you're, throughout your writing, that the, at least to me, <laughs> that that you you're saying that over and over again that that these ideas are fascinating and interesting but but to take but it's to take them literally in that sense is 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 awful i mean i i think you know when i think you're referring to to um lucretius when you talk when you're talking about the swerve and you talked about you know the the celebration of intellectual um, aesthetic reasoning and 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 the connection between intellectual distinction and aesthetic reasoning, and then you say this triumphed over the superstitious fears that threatened to sap the human spirit. And so, I mean, I'm I'm seeing everywhere the notion that that while celebrating these ideas is fascinating, that the fears that are the, the fears that lead to dogma that lead to religion is ultimately a negative thing. What I imagine happened is that uh, the person who came up with this account, mm -hmm. persons, uh, long before we have access to knowing how to do yeah. it, came up in the way that human beings, we admire human yeah. beings for doing, for, for speculative thoughts about uh, our origins. Yeah. And after all, when I walked through uh, the uh, the museum mm -hmm. just now, the ethnography yeah. museum. There are are dozens of of such stories basically being told about our origins. Many of which have to do with a single man and a single woman. Yeah, well, I mean, and time. you talk about that. I mean, uh, how that notion comes up over and over again. And the question is, I mean, it's not. Well, first of all, I mean, it's not an accident that we call this the Origins Project, yes. and because Origins no, no Origins are at the center of all of our thought, and even in, in science, they're at the center of the forefront of science is ultimately focusing on origins, and so it it's a nice word to encompass that. What's everything. terrifying is when a very interesting. Uh, Interesting fiction, good to think with, as Levi Strauss yeah, yeah, uh, would say. Would say. Uh, something really good to think of. Think about the pieces. You're, an, you're moving pieces around. You have a, a man and a woman, then somewhat strangely a talking snake, and yeah, then yeah. A, a god, a couple of crazy trees, imagine uh, 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 special trees. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has all the elements, delicious elements yeah. of a story. When that actually becomes uh, dogma, and when it drives out, it's used to drive out any other representation of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's because it's said to be the only truth. And then you start punishing people who have alternative speculations. And then you try to crush uh, any questions about this speculation. Then we're in terrible trouble. Well, you know, and well, it, it, it we, exactly, we are in terrible trouble. And that's, a, that and, and so, the notion that celebrating ideas and celebrating attempts to understand reality without giving them a, without m turning them into dogma, is a is a is a huge challenge for for, for humanity, I guess, and it, and it's something that we we need to continue to try and do. And, and of course, it must be true in science as well. That is to say, there is such a thing as dogma in science. Well, uh, well, there are quite, that's what I told you. Sure, scientists have dogma. The great thing about science, and and. The wonderful thing about being a scientist is to be true and wrong, and to learn to enjoy that, because yeah. it's it's a 
it's counterintuitive that science, I mean, we all want to prove, be proven wrong and prove others wrong in science because it's called learning. And, but we, you know, but, but the fact that humans are humans mean there is quote unquote dogma, but it's a different kind of dog. It's not, it's a dog where that's always, that can always be questioned. So it's maybe, maybe dogma isn't the right word for it yes. because, because the whole nest, essence of dogma is something that's unquestionable, at least in the well, rest it, of human. In any case, there's an institution behind it that will hit you over the head. If yeah, you, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, I, that, I, I think this is maybe pu pushes in a slightly different direction. I think one uh, problem that we face now, and maybe that to some extent we've long faced, is that um, the people who are most interested in the fictions and deeply engaged with them and profoundly moved by them have had so little access to and so uh, actually so little interest, motivation, desire to understand what the sciences are yeah, yeah. saying. Was, uh, that what, I mean, we, we could reverse it as well. I think of, I think, now, you can bear me out on this or disagree, that scientists, are, and particularly technology, uh, they're constantly coming up against problems that, have, that do not have scientific solutions, but have ethical solutions, ethical, that, that ask ethical questions that need answers that can't be answered entirely from within the so technology. The, the, one can't get off from is, is it, uh, the famous claim. Uh, yes, yes, and, uh, you know, I think maybe. Is if I have a friend, for example, who tells me that he's working on a gene mm -hmm. that, or a set of genes that seems to uh, uh, govern uh, intelligence, uh -huh. and the question as to what to do with that yeah. uh, knowledge is not a question that can be answered entirely within. Not, well, the, be, so the, I've had this. We can have this debate and discussion. Is it a debate? Time. I mean, well, do you I think actually no, disagree. I, well, I think that I think what we need to accept, and and in fact, we were just talking to George Church a little while ago about do about the ethics in some sense of doing some of the things they're talking about, which is enhancing humans. I think the the, the argument is without. I would argue. That without science, you can't make an ethical art. You can't, because... No, I, can, I entirely agree no, with no, that. No, no, no. So, so what I mean by that, to make it clearer, is that if you want to decide what to do, you need to know what the consequences of your actions are. And that is... So science can inform your decision-making. And I think, ultimately, and if I describe science to be skepticism and 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 rationality uh, uh, and experiment. That's all. I mean, it's nothing beyond that. Then I I think you come so close to saying ultimately what you would define as an ethical answer comes from reason informed by experience, and and that's science. Um, you know, but you know, some people. Yeah, but there's still people. People have argued that reason is a slave of passion, and 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 I think it was Kant or someone who said that. But 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 and you know that we we want to believe. So so we keep rationalizing uh, ourselves. But I think ultimately it's hard for me to see a, what what a, you and I would think of as an ethical solution to that problem that isn't merely reason informed by by experience. But look, what do you mean by experience? All I'm saying, to return to, to the point I was trying to make, which is that that I get, started to say that I think that the people who are most interested in, in f the fictions that humans create and takes most seriously what that means, that humans do this, and that it's an important part of our grasp of, ex uh, of our experience. Literature is the greatest experimental device for representing experience sure. that humans have ever invented. Yes. Th those people, like myself, have have had too little interest in and too little access to science, but the reverse is also true. Well, maybe. Uh, I know that, that's that interesting. The, that uh, the people who are doing... I mean, I, I hold us more responsible than the scientists, but I think that if you want to say reason informed by experience, the field of experience needs to be sufficiently subtle and broad. And it needs, from my perspective, to include, um, well, let's say, King Lear as well as Kant. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Homer as well as Spinoza. Uh, that is to say, it has to have a, a sufficiently broad 
base for what human beings have done to represent. I think that, uh, yeah, the experience of human understanding and human attempts to understand is part of that. Oh, absolutely. The inter- I was going to get to this maybe, and <laughs> I'm almost about to ask you, should you take it in a, in a fascinating new area that, so it's interesting for me to try and try and uh, jump to that. But I think that, that I want to talk about humanists, sort of what one might call humanism versus science, because there's a big debate or at least not debate. There's a lot of people who say that scientists are somehow trying to usurp uh, humanities, or or uh, and I don't understand it uh, I, because there's this argument of, that there's this is word that's been invented called scientism. That, that you, I'm, I'm happy to see you shake your head because because I'm amazed that people even because it's meaningless. What scientists are saying is reality is all there is, and and we need to try and use tools that help us understand reality. And and literature is, you know, it, it, I mean, is a beautiful way of doing the same thing, of, of, of sometimes not rationally, but emotionally perhaps, but even, but trying to reflect on the realities we see to maybe get new insights, which may not be testable per se, but they are testable because if the, if the novel is a success or, the, or whatever it is, or the poem, then it means it resonates with other people. So you must have tapped into something that 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 really does reflect a reality other people's people experience. So so you're experimenting when you're writing a novel, and and it only is successful if if somehow it for other people represents some something that they can sympathize with or under or that reflects some aspect of life as they as they want it to be, or or maybe haven't wanted to be. So so I, I I think the point is that. But what I want to say in that regard is that I I think that you know there's a bit, there is these two cultures that uh, that were discussed of you know, science and literature and science and culture being separate. And most of my life has been devoted to trying to say there aren't two. They're one. That science is part of our culture. But I think it's easier for scientists to argue that. I mean, I I I think more. I think. So it's to fair argue to be what? said that so, more scientists are read or or think about issue are willing to because in our society you're called illiterate first of all. It, it, no, no, it, I it, agree it, entirely it, with what you're saying. I mean that, that uh, I think it is easier for scientists. There's, it's easier not just because humanists are lazy, yeah. though they are. Uh, yeah, so so are scientists, uh, so too. but because uh, really of goes back to Galileo mm-hmm. uh, mathematics. That is, say, uh, you either you do or you don't oh, yeah. uh, have do, do mathematics. Yes, and yeah. if you don't do mathematics, uh, where, where are you in relation to to almost anything that's happened since the early 17th century? And well, at least those of us who are too old to uh, go back mm-hmm. to our undergraduate mm-hmm. days need and is people, and you are one of them, people who who have figured out how to make accessible. Uh, to those who are largely mathematically illiterate, uh, what the stakes are, what's happened. When I I wanted to bring together um, biologists and particularly evolutionary biologists with literary uh-huh. people, because again, I think it's a, 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 this is an obvious place in which our interests deeply. It's yeah. an origins project yeah. a, a place, and so I brought together. First in Berlin at the Wissenschaftskolleg, and then at, here at Harvard at the Radcliffe Institute, a, a quite in, interesting group of of biologists. Um, some of them do experimental things with uh, social wasps and lots mm-hmm. of interesting mm-hmm. things, and and um, literary people. And what did we do? We all collectively read a Shakespeare play. Okay. We didn't all collectively yeah. read. I mean, we read yeah. a few things by. Yeah. Also, yeah. We, we tried to read some of the things that the biologists had done, but. Exactly on your principle. The one thing we could assume we could all do was read actually an extremely difficult, after all, Mm -hmm. literary object, but that somehow we assumed that any educated person should be able to sit down and read. If if you wanted to talk about, for example, old age and what, uh, and succession issues, we read King Lear. If you want to talk about reproduction, we might read uh, The Winter's Tale and so forth. I mean, and we all collectively did that and then tried to bring our uh, different perspectives to bear, uh, to try to see what kind of conversation. And it was wonderful, actually. I loved it. It, I, it uh, would be wonderful. But, but it, it, it was based on 
the notion that the scientists had much more access to what we do than we have to what the scientists well, do. Well, you know, it's, it's, and it's, I think it's unfortunate. It's a shame because, uh, you know, I think it, in the, in the turn of the beginning of the 20th century, I think the notion of literate literacy included some understanding of the ideas that were then current in science, to be able to talk about them at a cocktail party or, or, or whatever. And then science appears over the 20th century to become so much exponentially more sophisticated and difficult that, that a literate per person need not, uh, you, you don't feel you're, you don't, you can succeed as quite literate without, without any fundamental appreciation. And, and I, I think the interesting thing is I've, I've said to my students this, that I think Galileo is easier to read and funnier than Joyce. Okay. And, and, um, He's certainly easy to read. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or funnier. I don't know, but well, you know, he's there's full of joy. I mean, and what it's sad to me that when people that that Galileo, for example, is not probably not included in courses on you know on on world literature in some yeah. way. Um, that that but 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 the the notions and the and his techniques of discussion and and the ideas you're talking about are just as central. Yes. To our understanding of ourselves as 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 you're Joyce, right? But what's sinister, really, about the division that you're talking about is in conjunction with uh, with technological advances in medicine and so forth mm. and so on that are based on scientific work. We it's quite possible for people to uh, get the benefits of that. Uh, without work, that any with, of the work, without not only without doing any of the work, but holding on to the most bizarre There's, and primitive ideas of of the nature of the universe. Science has this unfortunate thing: is that it has produces technology, it produces something of use. So most people, many people, say, "What's the use? What What's the use of doing this science if it doesn't produce a better toaster or better oven or, or extend my lifespan?" But no one would argue that Shakespeare. Um, you know, is is useful in the sense directly useful. Obviously, it's useful in in the sense that you and I revere, but it doesn't it doesn't get you allow you to to get from one place to another faster, or extend your lifespan, or do anything else. And so we we learn to appreciate literature and art and music just because they're products of the human brain. But no, that's science stuff. You have to be a scientist to appreciate it. And I think that it's that. That is particularly unfortunate that we, and I think it's because somehow we've divorced the cultural aspect of science, which is the the same ideas that Lucretius and and are raised in Adam and Eve and and, and are raised in Shakespeare. The same ideas of our where do we come from, where are we going? The same thing that drives us all is what drives the intellectual aspect of science. Separated that from the technology, and somehow science has become something separate. And and so and you know, but I found this come to the fore actually in reading one of the later chapters of of Adam and Eve, where you bring up Darwin. Talk about in some ways how the in the fall of Adam and Eve, there are two aspects of it. One is the scientific aspect, which is Darwin. The other is the intellectual aspect, and I I, and I hadn't read, known about Twain's work um, until I read read your book. Uh, and but the arguments that he gives are ju are just devastating. Yes. intellectually devastating and i when at the, early in this conversation at the very beginning you you asked what people surely must have realized this and i wonder how many people realize some of the things that twain brings yes. up but just were too afraid to say it for well I, I i believe they might not have realized it in the form and even what we mean by realized they might not have had the thoughts in the same yeah. form that you that, that that twain does probably not or i mean in the case of twain you go back to the late 70th century where people start yeah, yeah. more or less leaving traces of this right. saying this. Mm -hmm. But I tend to believe that in matters of interpretation of stories, for example, people always had access to this thought because yeah. they're human. Yeah, I mean, sure. So that the it's, thoughts are it, free. It's quite significant that to me that the earliest surviving trace of the story of Adam and Eve are those Nag Hammadi codices yeah. uh, dug up from the sand in Egypt uh, and dating, still not dating anything like the origin of the story, but dating, let's say, from the first century of the Common Era. So those little books discuss the story of Adam and Eve, and they say that Satan is the hero, that a yeah. god who says that you shouldn't yeah. uh, have knowledge must be the villain. Yeah. So 
that means the thought was totally available 2,000 years ago that, that there's something disturbing about the story. On the other hand, they're buried beneath the sand for a reason. Yeah. Uh, someone had to bury them. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, the process that you described was clearly already at work 2,000 years ago, which yeah. is, uh, this is not an acceptable thing to say. Yeah. But it was said, was thought, it's always available. Humans, plenty of humans are stupid, but not all humans are stupid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, it, it, and that means in almost any of these, the deepest things that, that, creative artists have thought and tr and left traces of this always been possible to i think uh th think counter yeah. to think at an angle not yeah. to accept the dominant interpretation that's i think that's why the fictions are valuable yeah. because they exercise the human ability to to uh move uh, obliquely in relation to the official account That okay, that's fascinating because, it, of course, of uh, you one one imagines that well, people have ev many many everyone throughout history has asked the, the same profound questions. It's not not everyone's given equally profound answers, or at least followed their their mind through that. And I wonder, you know, when you talked about the story of Adam and Eve being profound in in the in the philosophical and ethical issues it raises, which it is. I often wonder, I mean, again, as someone who, <laughs> I remember when I was in high school taking English classes and often wondering when I was analyzing this, and now that I've written books, I see it when people write about me, but, but analyzing these poems or sorry, and just wondering, well, you know, maybe the person just wrote this down and, 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 and these deep, deep thoughts that, and, and, the, and the, the issues that we're raising when we try and deconstruct it or whatever, is it, it, it are we imposing some some profound aspect that really wasn't there. There's something that moves us. And I'm wondering with the Adam and Eve story, which clearly raises these issues, but do you, maybe because it evolved over th over a long time, thousands of years, perhaps, as you point out, in one way or another, the Adam and Eve story is so pervasive throughout early, early human uh, writing or talking or storytelling. But, do you think that that those profound issues resided there, or were they just, or was Adam and Eve just a simple way of explaining something that people just had no possibility of understanding at the time? And let's just let's just let's just classify it and and get it out of the way. I mean, do you ask a question in effect that's about the nature of myth, yeah, and all myths. I mean, would would equally apply to Oedipus, sure, uh, or to to innumerable other. Uh, myths that I believe and you believe don't have divine origin, mm -hmm. that they were m made up yeah. uh, by people, and then they begin to circulate. Uh, if you're asking, is every thought that's been had about Oedipus or about Adam and Eve already in the in the head of the first person who circulated <laughs> yeah. that story? Of course not. Yeah. Yeah. Any more, uh, it would yeah. be true of, of Shakespeare or Mozart yeah. or anyone else. I mean, mm. but the it, human beings don't, uh, our lives are, are at least in the traces that we leave behind, are not limited to uh, this particular moment or this particular identity and the and the fantasy that it should all be in the head of this single individual is a kind of quasi theological fantasy. Yeah. I mean that it's what happens is that is that we survive as a species because we've developed cultures that that keep circulating objects and uh, the but the exist the fact that it didn't all happen in the head of the person who came up with this doesn't mean that the the questions are of course not, not real or even not that that they're not in the story yeah it just it has a slightly naive account of of what it takes to create something or, or how much is conscious in what one does it's not an accident in the Shakespeare's case that he invented virtually nothing. He's always ripping somebody off. Uh -huh. But the ripping off is the circulating of of stories. The the little salt story that the 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 third daughter who says I love you as much as salt mm -hmm. that goes back a tremendously long time. Shakespeare does a version of it in King Lear. Uh -huh. uh, that so uh, does that make the original story? Does that mean that it's less powerful? Yeah. Does less profound? On the contrary, to me, it, it, the circulation actually is part of the profundity, and it goes back to something you said earlier about you read these things and you realize that uh, the same problems. Well, 
that's that's true, but it's it, it it's it, it's true that we experience reading the works by dead people mm -hmm. often that if they mm -hmm. matter at all to us, we think, oh my God, this person has written a letter directly to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, that's part of the thrill of the survival of anything from yeah. the past that actually is reaching you powerfully. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's much more complicated than that. As we know, if you actually look back and see how many changes that the thing has, has gone through to reach you and to still be accessible to you. Yeah. And that those changes include, among other things, you know, things that look simple, like how that they, they've been translated or how they've been, what kind of material that yeah. they're on? Where did you buy it? At the bookstore? What do you mean at the bookstore? And yeah. so forth and so on. I mean, a whole set of transactions of institutional transactions is if you actually sit down and try to figure it out, you're in a more, much, much more complicated set of exchanges with the past that add uh hundreds, thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of other human agents who've been able to add something, massage something, transform something from this ancient uh, record. Your chapter on Darwin and and uh, Adam and Eve really resonated with me, not just because I, I'm a fan of Darwin, but because of something, there's two things. One, it reminded me of the whole Adam and Eve story and, and, and the confrontation that of course modern evolution in terms of uh, does to literate to, to the religion and and the whole and I, I love the way Hitchens described the Adam and Eve story in some sense that we're born born sick and commanded to be well which is just the perfect to me the perfect utter contradiction that makes m most of modern religion despicable in my opinion is that what Hitchens is yeah. just, that's interesting because it's a it's a quotation as Hitchens probably knew from a 17th century English um, pro a poet named Fulk Greville, who was oh, a Calvinist. Uh, oh, wearisome condition of humanity, born under one law to another bound, created sick, commanded to be yeah. sound. Well, see, there you go. I'm sure, I, I, there's no doubt that Hitchens got that. Oh, well, that's lovely. I've learned something. Uh, well, many things. But, but what you raised about Darwin that had never occurred to me what we receive from our forebears is not chastisements, but living traces of success. Namely, the Bible is all about the fact that the early, that what, what what our lives are we suffer because of the sins of 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 our ancient you know ancestors, particularly Adam and Eve, and forever will be will will be in sin. But rather, we're here because of the successes of our ancestors. That we're only here because a whole series of unremarkable. And an improbable uh, survival of, of of successor generations that made it to us. We're the one. We're the we're the products of success, not failure. Yes. And and uh, and that. But the notion that 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 idea would would confront Adam and Eve, I found to be fascinating. Yes. Uh, uh, it it the particularly confront Adam and Eve as interpreted by. The Christians, I mean, yeah. because the, especially Augustinian Christians, mm -hmm. because the story itself doesn't necessarily altogether imply that we're the inheritors of this disastrous past. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could say that it does already uh, from what's, what we read in the Bible, but the rabbis never quite went yeah. there and the and nor did the mullahs uh so they the, neither uh judaism or islam is haunted by this uh, at least it, m centrally haunted by this idea of a an inheritance but uh, because um christianity through after augustine embraced the idea that there's something fundamentally wrong with us mm -hmm. uh, it's after all a perfectly reasonable presumption I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. given what, what, how we behave uh that that there has to be something other than just following bad examples we must be bad as it were uh, intrinsically intrinsically built yeah. in there's something off about us and tried to figure out how that could be transmitted and augustine came up with the idea that it was transmitted sexually. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that it is it, it, the first thing to say is it's just not, it's not, it's important to understand this, not just as a sort of coarse or crude mm -hmm. idea, but yeah. as a actually quite deep set of mm -hmm. uh, attempts to understand why we fuck up the way we do yeah. constantly, yeah. I mean, yeah. generation after generation. generation. Yeah. Uh, and the, um, and that there has to be some explanation that's it's built, inbuilt, Mm -hmm. um it, it, and then it 
how far would you go back? Would you go back to the very beginning and try to look at that story and so forth? It's, it's, so the notion that we are the result of successful adaptations mm -hmm. uh, is shocking mm -hmm. in relation to that uh, perfectly, yeah. I suppose, deep account. Sure. It's not, not childish account, deep account of, of what our woes, yeah. uh, where, uh, the origin of our woes would be. And then, of course, it also was, there are a whole set of things, of course, in Darwin, including simply the question of what to deal, how to deal with time, the enormous extent of time uh, that this, yeah, this takes course. place. It remains actually tremendously tricky for, uh, to get one's head around. Oh I yeah, mean, it's totally uh, non-intuitive. We, yeah. we, we, you know, a thousand years is hard to, right. it's hard to grasp, much less. And, and yeah, that's the central problem of of uh, of of the confrontation of evolution in modern society is the, pet, the the notion of long long time, which some people get around by saying there isn't long long time and therefore evolution, ha you yes. know, has to be wrong. But you know, the the interesting thing is, uh, as you speak, that of course that negativity that that primordial flaw in us is also in some ways built into into uh, Darwinian selection in the sense that we retain. So many things, so many uh, uh, vestiges of evolution that are not particularly um, useful or productive or, or good. No, absolutely. Uh, it, it, why, why else do we eat McDonald's? I yeah. Mean, they, or why they, do we? we uh, you know, why do we eat, breathe and eat even through the same yes. the same place? And there's so many things we could we could yeah. go through, including xenophobia. We had yes. a we had a, a work a meeting and a public event on uh, origins on xenophobia. Xenophobia actually is useful. At some level, us versus them is useful at a cellular level. Yes. Just in term, but but at a certain point, it becomes counterproductive. Yes. Well, I, 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 as you know, I mean, having read the book, that I end in in Uganda, where right. I went to look at at uh, chimpanzees to see what uh, our origins actually, in some as close as we can see them. Then not we're not descended from chimpanzees, but mm -hmm. we think that they're closer to our yeah. the last common yeah. ancestor. But chimpanzees live together in a, what looks like an incredibly sweet life of, of mm -hmm. I mean, not sweet mm -hmm. for, the, uh, for the ones who are being beaten up by and the alpha torn. male, but otherwise yeah. perfectly, it, when I saw them, they were grooming each other, taking yeah. care of each other, taking care yeah. of their babies, living, I mean, it looked like the peaceable kingdom. But if a chimpanzee from another yeah. group gets anywhere <laughs> near, torn apart, they go crazy. They start screaming, they get diarrhea, they, they go wild, well, they, and if they catch them, they tear them apart. They te literally tear them yeah. apart. I yeah. mean, they're vicious and violent. Yeah. I mean, we people often, talk, we've talked about, but the, the, we're part bonobo, part chimpanzee, yes. and we could go into that. But by the way, just as an aside, a lot of people say the same thing about science fiction, by the way, that it gives an opportunity to make politically acceptable comments about that really reflect today. I mean, the first interracial kiss on TV was in Star Trek because it was a. Okay. You, I mean, that it gives you by inventing an imaginary world, you can you can show the foibles of our world in a way which is much more acceptable yeah, than makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But but the one thing I wanted to, I mean, that we don't have enough time to do justice to Tyrant. But but uh, uh, the thing that I, I found most interesting was this almost the same question we began our conversation with: Why did it take so long, or would it have had? You know, did it? Why did it take so long to overcome the the dark ages? The the, the interesting question that you talk about, at least that I got a, 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 um, initially out of the discussion in Tyrant, is the question that one is saying in Shakespeare and other places. People are reflecting: How can people? How can people? What is it of, that allows people to to buy into someone who's clearly going to hurt them, who's clearly lying to them, who's clearly boasting and and how can they what are the processes by which they allow themselves to be tyrannized yes and and that that's fascinating about shakespeare and i wonder and and it, and, and the question shakespeare I wanna, has a phrase for it i mean voluntary bondsman yeah to be a voluntary servant to to do this to be in why would anyone be a voluntary bondsman Exa exactly yeah. but but we do and it happens and and it seems to happen over and over again in human history and and uh, the question and so when we are living in a time when clearly we, we, we uh, I think it's fair to say that we're the most tyrannical of sorts leader has been brought in clearly uh, with many doing many of the things that 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 ideologues and that demagogues have 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 uh, more demagogue than ideologue because they don't think he has any ideals. But uh, uh, throughout history, the question I want to ask is why did it take so long? In some sense, if you look at writers of at least America. 
from Tocqueville to, uh, for me, Sinclair Lewis is the, is the, you know, from It Can't Happen Here and Elber Gantry, they all anticipated yes. exactly what we're seeing today. The writers, as good writers do, anticipate those things. In some sense, is it surprising to you that it's taken so long? It's not surprising to me that it's taken so long because we had a set of, of both uh, institutional structures and norms that seemed to inhibit it, mm-hmm. um, I would have said. So that we had, um, uh, as a political culture, certain expectations. The envelope was pushed mm-hmm. on various occasions uh, as to how people could behave. But we assume, what often happens, we assume that those norms are solid and will hold. And then you're astonished when they don't. Uh, so, But they seem to be, for a long time, they seem to be written in stone. And likewise, we have a series of institutional, really mm-hmm. because of, mm-hmm. the, of the founders, we yeah. have a series of checks and balances that seem to keep uh, separation uh, among yeah. the three uh, parts of government sufficient to to restrain these developments, but over the last, um, you know, it t- was a slow process. But it takes a while to to break down those uh, to break. Uh, separations, and then you get. You're right that, of course, the fact that at least in Shakespeare's account, this happens because there are a series of enablers that yeah. that will will. It, it's not never the 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 single individual, the tyrant who succeeds. It's a whole structure of enablers who think they're going to get something from this. Sometimes they do, often they don't, often yeah. they get screwed. Yeah. But the but there are people who think that it's in their interest. But that's always been the case. You're right. Yeah. There's all. I mean, that people do what what they think is in in their interest. Yeah. But the very brilliant people who I think they were flawed. They were horribly yeah. flawed in keeping yeah. slavery at the beginning. Yeah. But the but the people who set up the institutional structure accounted for this because they had had experience of tyranny uh, directly. So they yeah. wanted to get out from this, and they figured out uh, how to impede it. But impeding it doesn't mean prevent it. Uh, and the the norms are a perfect example. You know, we th- or some things are norms, some things we just are mistakes. I thought we had habeas corpus that yeah. would keep us from being taken to to uh, stuck in a prison, yeah. and and never given put on trial. But evidently not. Yeah, I thought really. Yeah, uh, I, I. But evidently not. Well, and I thought we had uh, uh, norms that said that if someone was uh, leader was caught serially lying, that he would. Uh, actually lose power. No, evidently well, you know, not. That's, I think that's the key point, that last one. is. It seems to me what we've learned is, is that we are as susceptible to people who can lie openly and unabashedly and continually in spite of evidence. Um, you know, it, it reminds me of of getting back to a little bit of science that that the, the amazing Randy, who's a magician who likes to, who, who's wonderful in the sense that he's exposed many charlatans, demonstrated the problem with scientists is they assume people are telling them the truth. They, the, the, the inherent success of science works by assuming scientific researchers aren't lying. When they do, it causes big problems. And there's long, because you assume when someone's reporting on something, they're telling the truth. And he, he sent some, some um, of his uh, protégés into an experiment looking for ESP. And, 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 and he said, if anyone asks you, are you lying or are you do- doing tricks? Say, yes, yeah, I am, I am. And of course, they were the two people that were discovered to have these properties because the scientists assumed they were people of goodwill. And in some ways, in spite of the fact that the system is built on checks and balances, there's this presumption of goodwill and someone who can lie effectively somehow defeats the system. And it's it's fa- and I don't know to what, maybe in a future discussion we can have to what extent that lying is an aspect of, or deceit is an aspect of Shakespeare's uh, tyrannies. Um, well, but- Shakespeare did think precisely that. I mean, deeply, deeply, deeply. That is to say, uh, Shakespeare thought, evidently thought, that there was a relation, a disturbing relation between, um, I mean, he was in the mm-hmm. business, between uh, passing fictions off on people as truths, mm-hmm. uh, manipulating their... Uh, capacity to believe, uh, tricking them into accepting illusions as reality, and what it, what he was doing professionally. That say that's that's what Iago does. That's mm-hmm. what Antony and Antony Cleopatra mm-hmm. does. That I mean, there's a whole series of characters in Shakespeare 
terrifying uh, characters yeah, who do what just that. playwrights do. Well, look, uh, you know, I, I knew this would happen. I, I could talk to you all day long, and it's just, it's the same feast for my mind as when I read, and I just can't thank you enough for spending the time. The thanks are mine. Yeah, okay. Thank you. The Origins Podcast is produced by Lawrence Krauss, Nancy Dahl, Amelia Huggins, John and Don Edwards, Gus and Luke Holwerda, and Rob Zepps. Audio by Thomas Amison. Edited by Evan Diamond. Web design by Redmond Media Lab. Animation by Tomahawk Visual Effects and music by Rickolis. To see the full video of this podcast, as well as other bonus content, visit us at patreon.com slash origins podcast.